uh, it's a bunch of different data points, contact points throughout the class. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about how faculty can model this in the classroom and some different benchmarks to look at. And then I'll turn it over to Dr. Blizzard, who's going to talk a little bit more from the student perspective. A little general background from both of us, though. Uh, I, I think that it is important to stay skeptical with any new technology in the classroom. Uh, Clifford and I have joked that we don't want to be the guy who's still using uh, overhead projectors 15 years too late. And I feel like there is a way in which teachers, uh, especially online, discover new technology, new ways of interacting uh, that we think are really exciting and we just put them right into play without stepping back and thinking how we can best use them in the classroom. So I think, um, if you're sitting there and you haven't really embraced using video in the classroom yet, or you're in fact uh, reluctant to do so, that's the right attitude. You're the exact people we uh, want to reach. It's important to not assume that it's beneficial just because it's new, just because there's this interactive element to it. We need to um, basically pick our targets. And that's a little bit about what I want to talk about next. We need to constantly be thinking, when do we use it? And how are we going to be integrating that with the learning outcome course of the week? Because, again, we don't want to just be showing movies in class because we've run out of things to talk about. I think when we're trying to develop this overall culture of interactions in the classroom, we have a lot of different tools for doing that. Video is just one more tool. So we're not going to stop doing the things that we have always done. And we're not going to necessarily let this take the place of any of those other things. If you're more comfortable interacting on the discussion boards uh, using uh, typing out paragraphs, I think that's great. There's no reason to stop that. So we're not trying to supplant anything. Uh, we're just trying to sort of identify where and when, uh, from a faculty perspective, this might be helpful to integrate into the classroom. Important to pick some targets. And uh, two things that I've sort of drawn out from my experience, both in an English 122 pilot, which used video interaction throughout the class, uh, and in my own English 225 introduction to film classes, where we use video quite a bit, um, both as subject, but also as a means of communication. Two things I've sort of pulled out is that we can use video uh, as instructors to inform, and we can also um, use video to interact. Now, I'm aware of both positives and negatives to each of these. Um, to me, if you're using video to inform, uh, I think there's a, an inherent positive to that because there are some concepts in a class that just aren't bullet points. Uh, they're not simple one, two, threes. They can benefit from a human voice explaining and articulating higher order concepts. And I think it's also really possible to just use a couple of quick sentences to draw connections between things that might be very difficult to have to type out on the keyboard. A negative to that, though, is that it's going to make it seem as if you're giving a, uh, a, a a final statement on something. Just like when we write guidelines for a paper, uh, a student might read those and think, well, this is what I am going to do, exactly this. And as teachers, we always know that the assignments that come into us that surprise us are the ones that we're most excited about um, and that are typically the more accomplished. So we don't want our video discussions or our video explanations to seem like the end point. We'll talk a little bit more later about how we can sort of achieve that difficult balance. In terms of video to interact, um, now, first off, I'll say that I'm not talking exclusively of synchronous video chatting. Uh, I do think it's possible to have interactive videos that are asynchronous, where basically you discuss one particular idea or topic, and a student will post a video, you will post a video in response, etc. could go back and forth. And this comes in with the idea of having that culture of video where it seems very natural to just click the camera on. It can be a very positive experience because I think what you'll see is that student perspectives uh, are sometimes very different from your own perspectives. That probably goes without saying. Um, I'll get a little bit more into that in a second. But I think uh, having those face-to-face -face, uh, kinds of chats, even if they are asynchronous, it gives an opportunity again, to put that human element on things, but also to explain things and to redirect and pivot very quickly, if need be, based on the information you're getting back. 
Um, if a student has misinterpreted your guidelines and submitted a paper, basically, uh, unless you have a rough draft uh, opportunity in your classroom, then their only feedback is going to be that final grade. Whereas if they're talking to you through their explanation of uh, guidelines, let's say just reflecting, you're able to listen to that and think to yourself, okay, they got it, or actually there's some problems here. Let me click the button and record a quick message back. The negative side to this, of course, though, very similar to with videos to inform, is that it might kind of just seem like two different parties issuing edicts without any actual coming together. Um, so it'll be important to scaffold these discussions. And that's one thing I'm not going to talk an awful lot about today. Um, every class is different. Every instructor's ideas of how they want to control or um, refine these interactions is going to be a little bit different. Um, and I do think that video interaction with students, um, whether it's student to student, as Clifford will talk about, or faculty to student, instructor to learner, uh, I think it's important to have clear expectations for what those are going to be, not just talk for three minutes about your assignment, but some very uh, clear scaffolded bullet points. And that's where my experience with the English 122 pilot really um, brought me to some of the insights that I shared on the last slide. Uh, one of the really important things that I discovered in that class was that my students, if I just went based on what they typed in the classroom or their emails to me, many of them seemed like they were just dealing with the assignments that were in front of them. They weren't thinking about uh, how they felt about them, how they thought they were doing, uh, whether they were grasping the concepts. It was very logistical, and I think people uh, who've taught Ashford classes uh, or any class online probably have seen students sort of struggling with logistical elements um, to the detriment of talking about higher order concepts. When video was introduced, though, into this class, what I found is that students often talked not only about their own uh, sense of their learning in the classroom, but they also talked about the concepts in a more, uh, in a deeper way, I guess I could say. Um, and so what that meant is that often a student would be telling me something that I wasn't getting from their paper. And so that would give me an opportunity to talk back to them and say, hey, you know, you just said some really great things about your thesis statement that actually aren't there on the page. Or you've talked through your outline in a way that didn't really come through in the written assignment. Now, I teach uh, English 225, and we're talking about an English 122 pilot. These are writing-based, and again, I understand this might not translate directly to every class, but I think what I'm getting at is that we have students um, at any level who might think of writing as a strong point, and we have students who might not think of writing as a strong point. It's very clear that as they're working on their assignments, they're trying to get that writing closer and closer to the ideas they have in their head which means that video offers us a unique opportunity to get into their head a little bit clearer. But I think one thing that, that really surprised me from the English 122 pilot was that a lot of times students were dealing with competing streams of information. Uh, there was an opportunity for them to e engage in a peer review in that class. They also had a tutor review and they got, of course, feedback from me, the instructor. And after each of those checkpoints, they would be able to record a video to talk a little bit about what they'd learned. And I often found that I would be looking at the exact same peer review as the student and they would be getting something very different from it. Um, very different content wise, but also something very different psychosocial emotionally too. And that really hurt me to think that my students who were trying really hard would click their video on and they would say to themselves, well, I bombed this. And that's how they would open their video. And uh, it was, it was, again, I guess a great opportunity for me to use my video to talk back to them and explain, actually, uh, you didn't bomb that. I think you're misinterpreting uh, something here and there. I think that um, in addition to sort of redirecting the way they deal with information, it gave me a chance to really help them prioritize, to make them realize that this thing that your peer said might not be the most important thing to deal with, but this thing that your tutor said is kind of important, and why don't you focus on that? Um, I think one thing that I want to sort of end with is that a lot of people talk to me about 
video responses in the classroom, and they have a really difficult time understanding how to engage in the moment, how to actually respond to students. And I think it's a difficult line, uh, empathy versus control, scripted versus unscripted. Um, I just wanted to share a few things really quickly on this topic. Uh, I've been, been working with my wife a little bit, who's a speech language pathologist, uh, on some accessibility strategies, both for uh, work in the clinic and work in the classroom, and uh, came across in a book on children with hearing loss, this statement. Uh, and this goes to what I'm trying to talk about in terms of how we respond to students when the video camera is on. Responses that reflect empathy are those that convey respect and acknowledge and attempt to understand the feelings, perceptions, and interpretations of the parent. These responses increase the parent's feelings of autonomy and self-efficacy. They ultimately have a freeing effect. The others, the controlling responses, have the opposite effect of diminishing the parent's feelings of autonomy and self-worth and may result in resistance and over-dependence. This is, again, for dealing with children with hearing loss, but if you see through the magic of PowerPoint, I replace the word parent with the word student and just see how those statements resonate. We understand that we're supposed to respond with empathy, but do we always do it? One other interesting thing that came up in the research I was doing was that there's a real clear difference between how we respond with empathy and how we respond uh, with control. And I was shocked that many of the elements that um, are under the heading of responding with control um, or to control are things that I do all the time, agreeing vigorously, giving false hope. Yeah, you're doing fine. It'll work out well. Interpreting, telling the student what they mean. Those are all strategies that close down communication. And so I think that it's important to, uh, even if you sort of feel like you're the most empathetic soft marshmallow on the planet, I think there's always room to sort of step back and think about some of the strategies that we use pedagogically that might inherently be controlling. Um, but elements uh, that would fall under the empathy category, extending and clarifying, reflecting, per perception checking, how are you doing, how do you feel about this? I think those are elements that can really be brought into the conversation when we're talking with students, give us a little bit of uh, a, a place to stand and, and talk out from that can help us make sure that those conversations we have on video are both uh, productive in terms of content management, uh, but also substantive in terms of the way we are able to interact and encourage our students. And now I will turn this over to my colleague and good friend, Dr. Clifford Blizzard, who will talk a little bit more from the student perspective. Uh, but I'm delighted to be here. My name is Dr. Clifford Blizzard, and I'd like to carry the conversation now from thinking about video use by the instructor to communicate with students to thinking about how students might use video back and forth to each other in the classroom, particularly within the context of an asynchronous class discussion. So I'm going to go through a little bit of previous theory and research, and I assure you it is very quick. Uh, then I'm going to turn my attention to the current role of video within a course that I co-developed with uh, Dr. Chris Foster of Doge, Honors 270, thinking critically about global issues. And uh, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about a recent time in which I taught the course and uh, promoted a much more enhanced role for video and what came of that. And really what lessons I've learned and what that might tell us about thinking about using video in the classroom. And before I go any further, I wanna echo exactly what, uh, what, what Nate uh, spoke about earlier, about thinking of video as a tool <clears throat> but one that one should be cautious about. What, what are the goals behind how it's being used? And one big takeaway I'm gonna be bringing up is the question of how well does video really work in an asynchronous class discussion? And maybe it's the discussion format that needs to change in order to make it work more effectively. So with that in mind, my lone slide of theory and research, I'm really coming at this question of the role of video for the classroom for students, primarily from transactional learning theory. The idea that there's a distance between the instructor and learners as a result of the online context of learning and that this can lead to gaps in knowledge and misunderstandings. And to bridge this distance, there's three basic interaction types, 
and Nate's already mentioned a couple of them. There's learner instructor, learner material, and learner learner. Now, learner learner interaction is really about the social social fabric of the classroom experience, so that students are interacting with each other, and then they're motivating each other, and they're actually learning from each other as well. Just as we talk about this, we give lip service to this in our in our uh, discussions. We talk about how oh, we're going to learn from each other. That's Learner learner interaction is a big piece of that. So a sense of being active participants in a learning community. So the idea that this is critical to, to the success of the student experience, if they feel like they're not alone, because certainly what, what comes up time and again in research of online learning, and this is for, this is for uh, instructors and learners, the sense of being out there isolated. And, and how do we kind of, bring that sense of being part of a learning community in. And it seems like video would be such an ideal way to do that. What I find remarkably baffling is that in a, in a really rigorous, I spent many, many hours looking into this, uh, exploration of what research is out there regarding student use of video in online discussions, I managed to unearth one study. Um, maybe they're being done in other languages, I don't know, but, but there was one study, it was a survey of graduate students, and it found that audio video was a, was a slightly preferred 53% by females, whereas only 22% of males were preferred audio video kinds of discussions to ones that were text-based. And it, and it kind of looked at how uh, maybe this is because of female desire to interact and develop bonds and, and social, social bond development or something like that. Um, this doesn't really match anything I found, so in my own study, my very, very limited study, certainly not as academically rigorous as theirs, but that's, that's the research as it stands. I think this is a field that definitely merits a lot more investigation. So again, the course uh, that, I, that I'm working at here, working with video in is Honors 270, Thinking Critically About Global Issues. And when we designed the course, we included in, the, in one of the week five discussions, a requirement that students provide a brief video, just a few minutes, I believe it was three minute video, uh, three to five maybe, highlighting uh, some aspect of their final project. The idea was this, that in, in a lot of conventional online classes, students do a final project and they're really doing it for the instructor effectively. I mean, obviously they're doing it so that they learn, but the other students aren't gaining anything from the experience. So how do, we, how do we get the other students to be able to, to learn something from what, each other, what everyone's done? Well, we'll embed this video requirement. So the students would share their final projects in the final week, some element with the class. Now, so the big goal here was that students would learn from each other, it was an academic goal, but also the thought was that this is a valuable job skill to be able to present orally and to be able to be comfortable using video as a medium. Uh, I recall an interview not long ago in which I was required to do a remote interview. I was given a question, given like three or four minutes to think about it, and then the video rolled and I recorded my response and I had one take. So being comfortable just recording a video and, and communicating that way uh, is, is, a, is a valuable thing. What we encountered, what I encountered in, in my first couple of iterations of teaching the course was that students had a lot of technical issues around the video and a lot of discomfort. One student remarked in public on, in the discussion where they embedded their video, they said, the student said, the video was awful and quite embarrassing. I hope I never have to see it or think about it again. Wow. And this is right out in the classroom. This isn't in a, in a, in a review just for me. And many students commented, it was 10 takes, I, I, you know, and oh, I had so much problem uploading this or whatever. So I thought about, okay, um, what we'll do is I'm going to enhance the role of video. And I was inspired by Nate Pritz, and I I'm so want to appreciate his work in doing that. What he suggested to me, what he, what he shared that he did actually, was to invite students to post in their introductions forum and to do it by recording a video with, you know, kind of mussed up hair and, and just a t-shirt on, not, you know, looking totally scrappy, but saying, hey, look, I'm just recording the way I am. You know, I'm not, I haven't worried about being formal to do this. Let's just get out and video and let's just talk to each other and not really worry about that. So trying to overcome that, that hurdle uh, around, um, around social discomfort of showing one's face 
and speaking um, publicly using the video. So needing to feel it, it has to be just right. So the idea was, I will invite students to post videos in all their discussions throughout the class. But I'll, but I'll begin with the introductions forum with this introductory video that offered encouragement. And the result in the introductions was pretty amazing. Out of 19 students in the class, 16 of them <clears throat> voluntarily, completely voluntarily, posted video greetings to, to, to other students. And several of those responded to other students using videos too. What I think was quite shocking is that six of those students who did video specifically stated without being asked that it was their first video they'd ever done at Ashford. And if there's one thing I really want to, to convey here, it's I don't think we're having students use video enough in the classroom. There are a lot of hurdles to doing so, but I think from a purely academic perspective and from the perspective of job future employment, that I think we need to be doing more, or at least for these six students, there needs to be more, need to be more opportunities. Again, this is a very small sample size, but it suggests maybe we need to be thinking more about it. So throughout the week's videos, however, only two students in the class voluntarily posted videos during weeks one through four. So for all the academic discussions in the course after the introductions forum, out of 19 students, only two chose to use video intermittently. They didn't do it all the time. So when we got to the week five discussion, 17 out of the 19 students posted videos. So almost everyone was able to do it. There were still a few comments about repeated takes and about technical issues with uploading, but there were fewer comments than before. One student even remarked, this was done in one take. I guess I'm a pro compared to the week one intro. So <clears throat> by having that introduction, one benefit was that the students were at least able to be more comfortable when it came down to the wire in week five. When they were really having to get everything done for the course, they didn't have that hurdle. So what have I learned from this? Well, as I mentioned, one thing that jumps out is that is that the, these honor students do not appear to have had much experience with video at Ashford University. And I really think that that could be really important to think about more, again, just from an academic perspective. Now, recorded video was quite successful in the introductory forum. I, and you know, one thing that's not thought about at all in the literature I talked about, uh, I'd like to propose there's value in talking about instructor-learner interaction. Now, I know that the focus here is on learner success and not instructor success, but I would argue that instructor engagement will in turn promote student engagement. If the instructor feels more engaged, they're more liable, I posit, this is a great research topic, folks, uh, to engage, in turn uh, have more engaged students, to take actions that promote the students feeling more engaged, whether it's just through the enthusiasm, through the degree of posting that they do, may do as a result. So I felt more a part of a learning community. I still remember some of the faces of the students in that class section, even though it was half a year ago. And I, I never remember student names. I, I'm terrible with names, you know, half a year or a year later. I really felt like I was more engaged that time around for getting to see everyone on video at the beginning of the course. What did the students gain? Well, they certainly gained technical skills. But did they benefit from learner-learner interaction? None of the students in their, in their surveys at the end of the course mentioned the video at all. So in the absence of any other means of gathering data, this particular you know, one-shot exploration didn't really yield any information about that. Uh, I have recently redesigned another course that I teach, uh, SCI 207, Our Dependence Upon the Environment, and that class, the students keep a weekly journal. And I think maybe something like that, uh, something like that component, which I find useful for a whole array of reasons I can't get into now, uh, would maybe shine a light on, in the moment, what the students thought of the video experience, something where they're recording about it during the experience rather than uh, in a summative, uh, brief survey, you know, toward the end of the class. So, my thought, though, is that I'm skeptical at this point about recorded video being an immediate option in other discussions. Repeated invitations to students to post videos didn't work. And if you think about it, a couple of things come to mind here. First of all, text has a lot of advantages over video for, for, from the student perspective, I think. And even from the instructor perspective. 
text can be edited repeatedly until you post it. And I think this is something that isn't, hasn't been researched enough. I'm one of those dinosaurs that grew up with a typewriter. And, you know, you, when you wrote and you composed, you really had just one shot, and that, or, or it was the correction ribbon time. It's easy now to compose on the, on the fly and then rearrange sentences and structure exactly what you want and produce something that feels polished that you can put out to the world. Video, it's a lot harder. The students ended up doing many takes sometimes because they wanted to have that same feeling. Text can be skimmed. You can just look through in a, in a whole array of discussions. The student can look through them, find something that jumps out, and respond to that particular student. In the video, how do you do that? Video is usually text plus recording time. So it's a lot that the students first will compose some sort of text, and then they'll read it. So then we have this kind of distance between students because the student is effectively reading what they've written to the other students rather than just sharing, you know, off the cuff sort of, um, you know, in the moment thoughts and reflections in keeping with a more conventional on ground synchronous discussion. So maybe video just doesn't work to mimic the quality of a spontaneous on ground discussion, at least in the current format. So uh, to wrap up, students would benefit from more video opportunities to ask for without a doubt. And I think video introduction seems like a great way to do this, uh, particularly if they're paired with a requirement later in the course for students to use video to share some aspect of a final project. Then it helps them get over that technical hump and get to know each other better. I think, I think research in this area would really be invaluable. I'm a little bit caught more cautious about the conventional discussion board currently at Ashford and whether or not discussions would work there. However, I'd like to propose kind of in passing here as a final thought that maybe there's still hope for mimicking synchronous seminar with a asynchronous video. What if a couple of things were changed about a discussion? Maybe there was a second discussion in the week in which it was framed to students that this was a brainstorming discussion session. Hey, we're going to throw ideas out for each other. The video might be limited to a minute or less or even 30 seconds. So kind of almost a Twitter approach where, where less is more, just a quick little pithy idea and then out. This might encourage students to, to engage in more creative thinking with a de-emphasis on the idea of you need to get the right answer. Students might then be required to make more frequent posts, maybe six posts or post at least twice every couple days or something. And then I think if the posts were to be labeled with some key words about their content, then it would help students sort of roll through them and again, find ones that spoke to them and view those rather than feeling the need to view all of them and respond. So uh, that pretty much wraps up my, ask, my portion of the talk. Uh, these are the sources cited. These will be available in the recorded form. And uh, we welcome any questions you might have. And on behalf of Dr. Pritz and myself, we are very grateful to have had the opportunity to present today.